بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مدن له ومن يذل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم it uh, is a great honor and a great privilege, uh, as always, um, to spend you know these Tuesday evenings reviewing knowledge that helps us to refine and to work on those aspects that are most essential to refine and work on within ourselves. Um, this is a session entitled Matharat al or Purification of the Heart. And um, our normal protocol is that we look at different diseases of the heart. We, we look at different spiritual maladies, different spiritual malconditions, we diagnose them, and then we discuss means of seeking cures to those diseases. Um, so this chapter, this chapter, this chapter was entitled Antapathy or being um, a cavalier in one's attitude or lackadaisical in one's attitude toward dying, toward meeting God, that one treats death, that one treats the meeting with God as though it was something insignificant, as though it was something that one does not need to prepare for, as though it were something not momentous. What are some of your initial impressions when you think about that? Bismillah um, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Um, Assalamu alaikum, folks. First of all, peace and blessings be upon you all. Uh, I would say just to start off with Brother Abed, you think you're nervous. Uh, I feel like I'm just the kind of, you know, the third wheel on this. this the real, we're, 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 we're waiting for the real part of this evening sure. uh, soon to arrive, sure. inshallah. Um, uh, but, you know, in all transparency, I will say, um, you know, uh, I spoke to some of the organizers of this evening before, you know, a few days ago when they told me what chapter we were doing. And, you know, I, I, when I heard that, it was like antipathy towards death. You, you sure you want to talk about death? Well, we're about to do a shahada at a wedding. Sure. I was like, please, please, somebody contact Brother Bates and just make sure that that's something he wants to talk about. And, you know, I heard back, hey, he said, let's go, let's go. So I said, okay. Well, we can talk about something else if you want to. Oh, no, I love this. I think this is actually a beautiful, I think there's beauty in it, right? Because mm -hmm. in talking about death and in thinking about death and contemplating death, we're really talking about life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I think, one of the things that, that stood out to me about this chapter. Um, I've, I've read this entire book several years ago. Um, and I thought I took a lot away from it back then um, until I've been reading it again for these classes. And when I got to this chapter, I realized, I don't, did, have I actually read this? Because I didn't really remember antipathy towards death being a disease of the heart, being something that could be categorized as disease of the heart. And when I read that, I was like, you know, the one of the, the first um, descriptions, I think it says something about the the mere mention of death causes consternation. And I had to think, oh my God, do I have that? Do I exhibit that? Um, and so I, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about the way that age works. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that when I was younger, I certainly felt a whole lot of consternation about death. I remember back when I think my father, he must have turned like 50, something like that. And he was talking to us daughters about purchasing a grave site for himself because he was like, you know, 60 years old. That's like, that's the time the prophet said, like, you're, you know, you're, you're, so I'm, I'm, and I just remember thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I am not thinking about this right now. No, mm -hmm. no. 
And as I was reflecting on this book, um, you know, some time has passed since then. Uh, and I've just realized that I've come to a place where I'm at least accepting of thinking about it now and talking about it and thinking about it less from an intellectual perspective and more from a personal perspective. So those are some of the things that came to mind. You know, for me, I was reading Professor Martin Wynn's book called Modern Muslim Theology. And there's one statement in the book that really fascinated me. It really captured my imagination. He said, in the same way that you describe people as living, you could also describe them as dying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When we look at someone, we describe them as living, <laughs> right? In Arabic, we say, <laughs> the person is living. He said, but every living thing is also simultaneously in the process of dying. Yeah. But one of the things about being unnerved by death is that for some people, the mere mention of death is something that produces um, great, not only consternation, sometimes outright frustration, outright anger. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he saw a bunch of people having a good time. They were laughing, they were joking, and, we're, and it's okay to laugh and it's okay to joke. You know, Alia was pointing out at the onset of the conversation that because tonight is going to be such a joyous occasion, to have such a weighty and heavy chapter is kind of incongruous. It's not exactly congruent with the theme and the vibe of the evening. And she messaged me and said, should we do a different chapter? And I said, no, I think this chapter is perfect. Because the prophet, peace be upon him, said, inside of your gatherings, when you're laughing and you're joking and you're having a good time, mix in that some reminders about that which in Arabic means the destroyer of pleasures, mashallah. Oh, I thought that was my mother, it's not my mother. So <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on edge, mashallah. He said, mix into your gatherings some reminders about that, the destroyer of pleasures. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that people of faith should be heavy, and morose and melancholy and ill-tempered. It just means that we accept death as the natural terminus of life, right? And that one should live vigorously, right? One should live purposefully. One should live intentionally, bearing in mind that every moment that we're given is precious. You know, the Arabic language, which, you know, I spent a great deal of time uh, trying to get familiar with the Arabic language. There is a lot of uh, secrets built into the etymology of words, right? Where words come from. So the word nafas in Arabic means breath. It's your breath, nafas, it's a breath. But the word nafis means precious because every breath you take is precious. Every breath you take is without uh, iwad, يعني. it's without uh, iwad. Ahmed, iwad, iwad, ma ma'an al-iwad. Did you give me another Arabic <laughs> word, man? <laughs> Iwad is uh, like, uh, you can't, uh, it does not have an alternate. Every breath you take, it does not have an alternate. So really, this chapter is not about sadness. It's not about melancholy. It's not about being morose and heavy and having this morbid fascination with end of life issues and death. It's just about recognizing that every moment that we're given is precious 
Every moment that we're given must be lived quite intentionally so that we can get the most out of that moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it, there. There's a line in there that talks about um, our society's uh, discomfort with the idea of death because of the fact that it's seen as morbid and it seemed, I mean, you know, that, that, that the idea of death seems like too morbid of a thing to be able to consider, to be, to be able to discuss. And I, I just think about, I think it's so interesting because in our society, you know, we, on the other hand, we sometimes we're, we're able to see death in its kind of perverseness. We're able to kind of dress up as zombies and skeletons and walk around and kind of, you know, but we don't want to think about it or talk about it. Um, when it comes to us, when it comes to our, you know, our lives and, and, and our reality. Mm. Um, and there's another line in there that I just think was really interesting about the idea of people, you know, of essentially death kind of knocking things down for us. We, we don't want to contemplate death because, um, or when we do contemplate death, when we begin to contemplate death, the first thing that comes to many of our minds is, essentially the bucket list, you know, what are all the, 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 what's all the fun that I want to do before I go, right? Mm -hmm. I, I need to get, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I have a reminder of death, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, well, what, I haven't jumped out of a plane yet. I haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know. I haven't visited Italy. I haven't, you know, mm -hmm. and those are, those are things that of course are not bad, right? They're not inherently bad things. Mm -hmm. um, but what started to kind of peak my, interest in that was just this idea of kind of going from the bucket list of pleasures to the bucket list of ajur, you know, of reward of like, how do we, and there's a part in there that's talking about the fact that if you're really thinking about death, you're thinking about life and you're thinking about what do I need to get out of life? How do I squeeze the most out of life? Not in a way that's just going to fulfill some hedonistic kind of, you know, um, you know, mm -hmm. sense of who I am as a human being as flesh and bone, but something that's actually going to get me somewhere uh, with the creator, with the divine, with the ultimate, you know, um, the place that we're all going. Um, and so it's interesting because I think we all tend to kind of lie on both sides of that. Um, I have things I want to do before I go. I want I have things I want to experience before I go. Um, but, you know, I will say that, um, you know, we've, our community, of course, has, has experienced a lot of death over the last um, several weeks, um, several people who, you know, have been very close to many of us. Um, and that has spanned from, you know, people as young as 15 to people in their, you know, 40s, all of whom I would still consider young. And especially the closer I get to 40, I'm realizing how young that really is, y'all. 40 is young. Just, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get there. Um, and, you know, I had this moment when, you know, two weeks ago to the day, I realized when we learned that our brother Osama Cannon passed mm -hmm. um, after the emotional onslaught, you know, that happened after the news of his passing, the first rational thought that came to my mind was, I got to finish that book. Mm. Some of you all know that for a long time, I have been calling myself an aspiring writer. I have chapters and chapters of novels that I have written for decades that have never had conclusions. The poor protagonists have just, they're just like languishing out there. Um, and I've, I just, I've not been on it. And the first thought that came to my mind was I've got to finish my books because if someone can pass at 40 something year old, years old, and that's something that you know, I feel like we all hear, you know, you hear a young person pass and you, you know, you shake your head, wow, too soon, you know, gone too soon. But that's still very intellectual to me. That's not, it's not, it, it's never been personal. It's never gotten down to that could be you, you, that could be you tomorrow. And if I go tomorrow and I know that I was given a gift by the divine of some, you know, some gift. And for me, I know what my gift is and I didn't do what I was put here on earth to do with it. That's, that's gonna be, that's the bucket list that I don't want to mess with, mm. you know? Mm. I gotta get that bucket list. Mm. I gotta get that one, you know? You know, it's interesting because um, <clears throat> one of the most poetic things 
I've ever read about death is that while death is ubiquitous, it's something that is occurring all the time everywhere, nobody actually believes that they're going to die. Mm -hmm. They say that in war, each man looks to his left and looks to his right and feels sorry for his comrade that is probably going to die. And he thinks about his wife being widowed and he mm -hmm. thinks about his children being fatherless, but nobody actually believes that it's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. And in the Quran, in the Quran, Allah talks about death and he says, Kullu nafsin da in qatul maut. Mm -hmm. Every soul shall taste death. Mm -hmm. This is a promise. Mm -hmm. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he walked into a cemetery. And he said, Ya Ahl al Qubur, O people of the cemetery, O people of the graves, insha'Allah, mm -hmm. al kama He said, We will be joining you one day, God willing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the commentary on this tradition, they say that in this, the Prophet was just teaching us how to have manners with God. That anything we speak about taking place in the future, we always say, if you will, but death is actually something that is hetman. It is something that is absolute. It is not something you have to say, God willing. It is something that will actually happen. And God says that he gives us a reminder, a dhakir. And there's many different interpretations about what is being referred to in this verse. Some people actually say it's gray hair, which, you know, I don't have much, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and other signs that you are aging, that you look at yourself and you can see your physical ability diminishing. You can see your physical constitution changing. Hopefully you can see something about your spirituality deepening. You can see something about your sensitivity deepening all of these are reminders that we are getting closer to the time of departure mm -hmm. and um imam maulud his focus in this chapter is it is a disease of the heart for someone to pretend as though none of this matters who cares yeah we're all gonna go one day and i hope i go you know uh, engaged in the most enjoyable pursuit that I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. As if that's going to do anything, right? He says, antipathy toward death is when one flees from it and becomes annoyed when death is mentioned. As if he is completely ignorant of God saying, each soul shall taste death. This is reckoned, or this is acknowledged to be among the diseases of the heart. So be content with what God has decreed. I remember we were having this conversation mm. last year. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that death was something you struggled with yeah. throughout your youth. That sometimes you would wake up at night and uh, be shaken, mm. just thinking about death. Am I recalling that correctly? I used to have dreams. Dreams. Yeah. Are you in a better place now? <laughs> yeah, subhanAllah. Um, yeah, in that conversation, um, I remember telling you, I think it was one of the last things we left off that conversation with about the fact that, um, that last year we buried my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Alice Jones. Um, and, um, that prior to that, you know, I had had lots of people in my life pass, you know, I've had lots of people die, mm -hmm. um, family members, grandparents, un uncles, aunts, um, you know, I've, ha I've, I've been to a whole lot of funerals. Um, and, you know, I've never really, it's been very difficult for me to get close to people who I know are in their last stages of life. I will say that mm -hmm. I've had that opportunity. Um, to be close to someone who's close to my age, who is passing into that stage of life. And it was very, very, very challenging for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I had the opportunity not only to bury our grandmother, but to participate in washing her body. Mm. We buried her as a Muslim, as she wanted. And, um, and, and so we washed her. My sisters and my mother and I, um, we participated in the washing. And it's not something that I can ever say that I really oh, wanted to do um, or ever, you know, I, I figured at some point in life that that would, you know, it would be the case. I have sisters, I have a mother, you know, in my family and, and God willing, mm -hmm. we will be able to, you know, do the, the final rites for each other um, mm -hmm. when that time comes, but I can't say I was ever eager for it. And so when the opportunity ar arose for that to happen, um, I of course said, yes, I will be a part of it, but I was, whew, I was, I was, cowering on the inside it was extremely difficult my sister who was here who was a part of that process I don't even know if you knew how much consternation I was going through um, at the time mm -hmm. but there's something about that process there's something about um touching um the you know the shell of a of a how does how did the prophet sallallahu peace be upon him in that um that beautiful story of, you know, a container of a human soul, touching the container of a human soul, the container of a human soul, that was my grandmother who was beloved, who we have so many memories of and who, you know, I'd known my entire life, obviously. Um, there's something about that that was just so extremely grounding. Um, and I think opened for me the possibility of viewing death not as something intellectual, not as something distant, not as something inherently morbid, but as something that is going to happen to all of us, mm -hmm. that is something that is a part of our lives and, and, and is something that we all need to interact with in a way that is going to make us make sure that when we leave this place, we're doing so in the most comfortable way that we can mm. and that our families can be at most comfort um, with our passing. And that means for me that I have to live my life in a way that makes it so that when I pass, I, I do so in a way that not only benefits me first and foremost, God, God willing, but also is able to be a comfort for my family, for those who love me, to know that death is not the end for me, that death is not, that's not a goodbye. It's a see you later, God willing. And it's a passing into something better and richer and more fulfilling for me. Mm. You know, he mentions, and I think this is significant, but if one detest death, not for its own sake, nor for the loss of pleasures that it entails, but rather out of fear of being cut off, from preparing for the day of judgment, then it is not blameworthy. So he's saying that if one fears death because one does not feel that they are prepared to face their maker, mm -hmm. that's not blameworthy. Mm -hmm. If a person is not ready to die because I have not done enough, I have not prepared myself thoroughly enough, I am not ready to stand and to be accountable for the choices I made or the decisions I made or how I chose to live or maybe how I chose to die. Mm -hmm. This is something that can be reconciled with being a God-fearing person mm -hmm. that I'm not ready. I'm not ready to uh, accept my eternal fate. I'm not ready to stand before God and accept my judgment. I'm not ready for that, mm -hmm. right? In fact, some people say that it is from piety to always feel that one is not ready for that, mm -hmm. right? You know, I remember once I was um, listening to my friend, Dr. Bilal Ware, and he was talking about a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, and he was talking about a verse of the Quran, a verse of the Quran. And in this hadith, the prophet makes clear that when people that are enjoying heaven, people that are in paradise mm -hmm. are asked if they could be given anything else, they're in heaven, what would they like? 
what would they do? And he explains in this hadith that all of them would say, we wish that we could go back to earth to do more good deeds mm -hmm. so that God would elevate our rank even more. Mm -hmm. If there was one thing I would want, this is, we're talking about the inhabitants of heaven, mm -hmm. is that God would send me back so that I could do more, mm -hmm. so that I could be better and receive and reap more reward from what I had sown on this day. And similarly, if the people experiencing punishment after death were asked, what do you want? If you could be given anything, what would you choose? I wish that I could go back to earth. I wish that I could be among the living so that I could choose obedience so that I could choose devotion, so that I could choose faith, so that I could choose prayer, so that I could choose generosity. And then, right, the, the conclusion that he deduced from that is that when you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes and you start wiping the crust out of your eyes, you are being given the thing that each of them wants time, an opportunity, a chance at righteousness, a chance at devotion, a chance at prayer, a chance at generosity, right? So here, Imam Maulud is saying, if one fears death because of that, I need more time, this is not a disease of the heart. In fact, this indicates that there is something sound in the heart. There is something healthy in the heart. That I want to use my life to prepare for my death and I'm not ready to die, right? Sometimes, you know, I say that to brothers, man. You know, when a brother is driving recklessly and speeding, I say, Habib, if we have to meet Allah, we have to meet Allah, but I'm not ready right now slow down. I'm not ready right now. Slow down a little bit. He's saying it's only a disease of the heart if one thinks about death and one thinks, man, if I die, I will be cut off from the pleasures of this world that I enjoy. If you're thinking about being cut off from pleasures in death, then this is a disease of the heart. Mm. MashaAllah, they are my children. Mm. Alhamdulillah, my wife. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. <laughs> my, my son has found his play people. MashaAllah. He says, also, if one completely entrust his affair, and by affair here, he means one's life, to his creator, and whatever his creator wills, either causing him to die or giving him more time, he's content with it, right? So ultimately there's no displeasure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, one is content with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, I don't think I had ever heard that before, the, the, I of course have heard or learned about people who are experiencing punishment after um, death in the life to come, of course, wanting to come back and do it all over again, essentially. Um, I don't think I'd ever heard of people in paradise if being, you know, if asked saying, I would wanna come back and do more. I think for me, that is just the most profound concept because at the end of the day what we're saying is that we're going to want the same thing and so why not do what we can when we can when we have the opportunity yeah. to we don't yeah. have to wish yeah. it's here we're here yeah. we yeah. every morning we can wipe the crust out of our eyes and say all right what you know what do i got today how do i how do i raise my rank you know higher today yeah. i think that's really profound you know it's mentioned that men you have will call allah but in allah you have will call Whoever loves to meet God, then God loves to meet them, mm -hmm. right? 
But this doesn't mean that one has jur'ah, like one is bold mm -hmm. in facing death. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a famous story about a great imam named Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And um, he was dying. And this was a man who was known for his piety. He was known for his piety. And as he was dying, and his, some of his students and his family, they were surrounding him. And um, they were saying, La ilaha illallah. There is nothing worthy of worship besides God. And just a quick practical lesson, if you ever happen to be in the company of someone dying, just everybody should start repeating, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. There's nothing worthy of worship except God. There's nothing worthy of worship except God. In hope that the person will join in and start repeating this refrain with them. But do not, under any circumstance, make the uh, already tense situation a contentious situation saying, say la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. Like, don't do that. Because maybe out of frustration, a person says, what are you talking about? I'm dying here. Or, or you know, it just, it can become, right? So some of the students of Imam Ahmed, Najash, did you speak to your auntie? Man? I'm talking about my auntie. <laughs> so some of his students, they started to say, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallah. And Imam Ahmed retorted, Lama, not yet. And they were shocked because either it was a statement of impiety, like don't start saying La ilaha illallah yet, or he wasn't ready to die yet. He said, Lama a second time, lemma a third time, which means not yet. And then he, you know, kind of passed out. And then he came back too. And one of his students said, our sheikh, our teacher, are you afraid? And he said, no. He said, in that moment, Satan came to me. And he said to me, Ahmed, you are victorious. You have defeated me. You have resisted me. And I was saying to him, Lama, not yet. That it is not over. The book is not closed until I draw my last breath. Not yet. Not yet. So if someone is not ready in that way, this is from piety. This is not a disease of the heart. He says, both of these attitudes toward death are commendable and praiseworthy. Either way, disliking the reality of death in no way distances you from its proximity. That whether one is open to that reality or one um, is constrained frustrated, frightened to that reality or by that reality, it is still very, very close to us. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yes, basically, look, whether you like it or not, it's coming. So do what you can, <laughs> you know, do with that information mm -hmm. what you will. You know, the prophet, peace be upon him, used to say to the companions, the angel of death, visits all of you three times daily, yeah. is acquainted with you and knows your names. He once said, death is closer to us than the straps on our sandals, right? So that we never feel, uh, we don't have tool al amal. We don't have these lengthy extended hopes, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about what life will be like when we're 80, 90, 
uh, years of age, that you recognize that, no, now has a fierce urgency, right? And you must take advantage of it, yeah. right? Never put off anything righteous for tomorrow, what can be done today? Because tomorrow is not promised. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is not promised. And um, um, would you like to comment or should we finish? Well, out the chapter? I, I would just say, you know, something that I, I thought about was, you know, I was in the room. I was the only one there when my grandmother passed. And um, so my family, you know, asked about how she went. And I remember my sister asking me, did it occur to you that the angel of death was in the room with you at that moment? Like, were you terrified when you thought of that? I had to tell her like, mm. I have to say, I'm very grateful that I did not think about that at that moment because I probably would have been a bit terrified, mm -hmm. but I've thought about it since. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I've, you know, I've, I've heard that, that, that mm -hmm. the angel of death visits you several times a day and that, you know, essentially he is a constant companion. <laughs> And that that's something that we should get really, really comfortable with. Um, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. He finishes with the lines, the one who constantly remembers death is ennobled with contentment, with his heart's activities directed toward obedience and with prompt repentance. The one who is heedless of death is afflicted with the opposite of all three. So he just finishes by saying, the impact of remembering death regularly is that you are content. You direct your heart toward acts of obedience and Whenever you do engage in something wrong, you repent, you repair the relationship with God very quickly because you recognize the matter is the way that it ends. El umur bi khawatimi ha. You know, one of the things that might strike people as um, not unjust, but maybe unfair is that God judges us according to how we end our lives. So that you could have someone, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that there is a person that when you see them, they're engaged in all of the actions of a person that you would think was destined for the garden, destined for paradise. And then toward the end of their earthly existence, they start engaging in other than that. They start doing all of the things that they refrain from. And God takes their soul in that state. And this is how they will be judged. And he also said the opposite is true, that you will see somebody doing everything wrong under the sun every sin imaginable they commit it they fall into it and then toward the end of their earthly existence they repair their relationship with god they repair their relationships with people they repent and then god takes their soul in that state so people that are regularly contemplating death people that recognize its nearness they're, they're never um, postponing acts of obedience. They're never postponing repairing anything that needs to be repaired. They're never postponing repenting to God, right? And rectifying their condition, mashallah. So I think that's probably a good place to stop and then